Liberation from prostitution is liberation for all women. As long as women are for sale, no woman will be viewed as equal either in corporate boardrooms or in their homes. Women on this earth are not free as long as we live with the risk of being prostituted, and we all do. To achieve liberation from prostitution, we need to address the social structures of the societies that bring people into prostitution and dismantle the cultures that create the demand. The Women's Front is a radical feminist organization. We see prostitution as the most extreme form of oppression on women. And we are not alone in this. Many, many women all over the world fight every day for a world free from prostitution. We organize with them and we make things happen. The Nordic model is spreading all over the world. The Nordic model aims to reduce the demand for prostitution by criminalizing the buyer and to create exit programs for people in prostitution. And it is working. We are so honored to have with us here today some of the women that have dedicated their lives to the fight for women's liberation and for the abolishment of prostitution. These women have been uncompromisingly pushing forward for the Nordic model. There will not be a discussion after this meeting. The panelists will be speaking for 20 minutes each, and then we will have about 30 minutes questions and answers. As we do not have more time, we will not allow any long monologues in that session. Questions of topic will not be dealt with either. This might seem a bit strict, but it is in our interest to let as many of you get your questions answered here, to, here today. So please prepare yourself with sharp and short questions. The first woman that I will introduce you to is Julie Bindel. She is the founder of an organization called Justice for Women. She is an author and a journalist in The Guardian. Julie has studied the field of prostitution for about 30 years. She has been one of the researchers that have documented and brought into daylight the failure of the Dutch and German model of legalized prostitution. Julie will highlight for us today the situation in the worldwide prostitution market, what, what powerful sources and forces are out there that keep the sex industry going and growing. Julie is at the moment writing a new book. This book will be about what we know about prostitution and the international sex trade and who we know it from. She will examine the global sex workers' rights movements and how the happy hooker narrative have come to shape our perceptions, including many women involved in prostitution or what is misleadingly named as the oldest profession. Julie. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, and, and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. And I'd like to pay respect to my panelists, sisters and comrades here, and thank them for the work that they all do. Um, today I'm going to be speaking about who is the political opposition to the feminist human rights survivor-led abolitionist movement. Because I think we need to know exactly the tactics that they use and how they are a danger to our goals, but how we can combat uh, and challenge the mythology, uh, the lies um, and misinformation that we get from, from the pro-pimp lobby. And I just want to give two little examples um, of how well organized and how active they are today. Um, one is right now as we speak here in London, England, there is a feminist conference being held which clearly states that although it um, will represent uh, a huge number of views from women, 
uh, around the world that its bottom line is that it supports criminalising the demand for commercial sex. Um, and that has caused quite uh, a lot of problems. And this morning, the English collective of prostitutes who represent themselves as women currently working in the sex trade, uh, which I am saying clearly is a lie, have uh, leafleted the entire conference with a view to disrupt it. Mm. And I'm so sorry that then they don't allow us to have our views expressed at a feminist conference uh, when they so clearly have the international stage pretty much to themselves at the moment, although increasingly challenged by the abolitionist movement. So that's the good news. The second anecdote was when I was recently in Cambodia doing research for my book on the sex trade, and I asked through a women's organisation, a Cambodian local women's organisation, if I could meet some of the women working in prostitution and if they could facilitate that, because going around the sex trade areas and just plucking women off the streets to talk to is highly unethical, I think, and also very dangerous for them. And this organisation referred to the women as sex workers and said they were sex workers' rights advocates. And she was helpful and friendly and said, even though it was me, that she would speak to some women and see if they would meet with me. Um, and she then asked me a series of questions. What is in it for them? What will you do with the information? All perfectly reasonable questions. And I said, well, bearing in mind that they are sex workers' rights advocate, ad advocates and they are pushing for legalisation or decriminalisation, what I will say to them is that I have been campaigning along with my sisters for decades to decriminalise the women in prostitution, anyone in prostitution. No one selling sex should ever be criminalised, should ever be seen as anything other than somebody in need of support. Um, so I went along to the meeting and it was early in the morning, it was 8am, so the women were clearly coming to talk with me after they had been uh, prostituted all night. And as they walked in and I saw the women, I instantly knew that the questions about what will you do with the information, will you misrepresent them, but aren't you a prohibitionist, that they hadn't come from the women themselves. These women could not wait to tell me about the abuse, the terror, the violation inherent to prostitution. But we were working through a translator and the translator kept telling me that they were saying, in sex work, this happens, in sex work, that happens. As a sex worker, I want this. So I was carefully noting everything and recording them. And then the woman who uh, runs the NGO, who was the one I was in contact with, told me that it was a wonderful thing for the women to be in a union, that they had at least 50,000 sex workers in Cambodia in this union, mm. and that what they did was that when the women were arrested by the corrupt police, who were abusive to the women, who would put them in prison not for prostitution, but for public order, uh, minor issues, that this organization would come along and get them out of jail the next day. That if they had children, and many of the women had children with sex buyers, um, or rather they had been pregnant by sex buyers, and that they would give childcare while the woman was in prison overnight. And this is why it was great for the women to be in this union. And suddenly everything became clear. This was not a union at all. Which woman in prostitution would say no to an organisation that comes along and says for 25 cents a month, if you are arrested, we will come and get you out of jail and look after your child? And I realised, of course, it's what pimps do, isn't it? And I then realised that this organisation goes all around the region, to South Korea, to Vietnam, to wherever, I think on your patch as well, Rachira, to speak about sex workers' rights and how Cambodian sex workers want legalisation. So do you see how they do it? These women want the police to leave them alone. These women want to come out of the sex trade so badly 
that they were telling me that for $200, if they had their proper papers, they could leave and they could get some kind of unskilled job. What is this organisation who is well-funded doing for these women? Why aren't they giving them the $200 and organising their papers and finding them somewhere to live, rather than using them as a mouthpiece for international decriminalisation of pimping and brothel owning? And this is something, and I'm interested to hear from you, Rachira, and any other colleagues here, this is a tactic that they are using. Because this funding to these NGOs, especially in the Global South, benefit no one but those who are running the NGOs. And I also want to go from that horrifically impoverished scene of these women who were some of the most disenfranchised, abused, and poor women I've ever met in the sex trade to the North, North America or Western Europe or wherever in the global north where men, white men, very well paid white men or women, but increasingly largely men, run anti-trafficking organisations that concern themselves more with men who are trafficked into um, the agribusiness and separate trafficking into prostitution with prostitution itself and are, I have to tell you, hindering our work, not helping. The more that we hear from these anti-trafficking advocates, the more we hear from those highly funded professionals who give keynote speeches at conferences about how trafficking is terrible, but prostitution, of course, they don't have a policy on it, the worse things get for us, the less funding we have to do our work. And I'm afraid I would go so far as to say that along with those sex workers' rights movements in the Global South, these white people in the Global North are our enemies to this movement. And it has to be said. And we have to do something about the colonisation of our movement by those that use the terms trafficking to completely sanitise what is actually happening in the sex trade and in prostitution. Will you tell me when I've got five minutes left, somebody? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, the pro-sex work groups, I'm just going to give you some global <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> pointers as to how uh, they, they organise. There are major funders of pro-sex work projects. And I wish, in a way, that it, we could just point to a conspiracy, to a global conspiracy, uh, that we could then infiltrate and disrupt. But it's not like that. There are people who are pro-sex workers' rights advocates for very good reason, from a very genuine place, where they honestly believe that the best thing that could happen for them right now, at this moment, would be to decriminalise the entire sex trade. And for them, because these people that we see that speak out, that are public, that write the books, that may have been involved at some time in some type of sex work, they're right. It is the best thing for them because they're not one of the majority, the vast majority of prostituted women, girls, boys and men around the world. They are the privileged few. So what they're saying is good for them. They are absolutely right. It's not, it's not silly. It's not off the wall. It's correct. But when did we ever advocate for the minority? When the majority is so clear, so present, so there to see. And these women aren't invisible. These girls aren't invisible. It's just that most of us walk past them and ignore what we're seeing. So there are many trust funds around the world that are run by libertarian men who might be anti-capitalist but they haven't quite got it in their head that capitalism is fueling this trade and this trade is fueling the worst excesses of capitalism so they, they put their anti-capitalist rhetoric to one side and they accept the sex trade as though it's something different run by independent entrepreneurs somehow maybe a, some kind of collective maybe the sex trade is run on the basis of a feminist collective a non-profit organization but we know that the reality is that this is fueled by money and by big business. 
So the Ford Foundation, for example, um, anything that George Soros uh, is involved in will fund to quite a large proportion sex workers' rights organisations. They will also fund uh, those organisations that are health-based, so they're anti-HIV and AIDS organisations, um, because, of course, they see that that is really the only issue for women in prostitution to keep them disease-free so that other people don't actually become inflicted with any of the negatives of the sex trade. And so the HIV movement gets a lot of funding. In turn, they run the organisations that support, to an extent, prostituted people. But all that is on offer is a sticking plaster, a band-aid solution, and very, very rarely any exiting pro programmes or any prevention programmes. So obviously one of their tactics is sex work is just work. Um, and I just want to read you a quote from um, a left uh, union activist based in Britain called Gregor Gall, who wrote An Agency of Our Own, a book about unionisation of the sex trade. And what he's done, and what many people in the workers' rights movement have done, is that they have moved the model of organising workers' rights, which is an honourable uh, campaign, and one that I certainly support, into the sex trade. And it's like trying to bang you know, a square peg into a round hole. It will never, ever, ever work uh, for people in prostitution. Um, and I'm sure Rachel will talk a little bit about that later on. But he says, the key foundation for organising sex workers is the perspective of viewing sex workers as workers who have nothing to sell to survive economically but their labour. This labour is deemed to be, A, sufficient, sufficient level of moral legitimacy, and B, social worth as a form of employment to be comparable to other forms of labour and paid employment. The perspective is also of sex workers selling sexual services and not their bodies and persons per se. Now, even if we just take the end bit of not selling their personhood, just not selling their bodies, just renting an orifice, for example... And whenever I say this, the sex work lobby comes back at me and says, how dare you call me an orifice? But no, this is exactly what the sex buyer and the pimp is seeing, an orifice. Well, we have reams and reams and reams of evidence from women who have left prostitution, who've survived prostitution, who say, no, it was my body that was colonised. It was not just me renting a service. It was me, to the extent, and again Rachel will refer to this, I'm sure, that I had to leave my body while this was being done to me. Similarly, the sex buyers, some of whom I have interviewed, and who have been interviewed by feminist abolitionists, by those who don't even take a position on this issue, and they always tell us the same. This is just sexual release for them. As one man said to me, it's like masturbating without using your hand. As another said to me, it's just a human need, it's like going to the toilet. Or others say, it's just like putting your washing in a washing machine. <laughs> right? So, there's enough evidence from the women, but thankfully also, increasingly, from the sex buyers themselves, that this is about colonising the body of the prostituted person. So how on earth do you make this into labour? How do you make this work? How do we think that unions can support women, for example in prostitution, when most of the work that unions do to advocate for women in the workplace is against sexual harassment. It is your job to be paid to be sexually harassed and violated. So how do we get round that one? Another one, okay, another tactic, is feminism is about choice. Right, okay. So let me just go back a little bit to when I was 17 years old and I joined the Women's Liberation Movement. In 1979, it was pretty much at its height. It was a wonderful time. And I recognised that this was about a collective political social movement with a proud heritage, like the civil rights, anti-racist movements, the workers' rights movement. That this was about all women being free, as our sister said earlier, 
that we do not care about the glass ceiling. We're not worried about women becoming chief executives of banks for now, right? We're worried about the women in the basement because the basement is flooding. The basement is full of women who are totally disenfranchised. So we join this movement and we become crowd activists. And we sacrifice a lot and we put a lot into it and we get every bit as much back from it. What then happens? All of a sudden, right, I wake up at 53 years old to find that there's a whole new generation of feminist activists who are struggling against the neoliberal claptrap of women who aren't feminists at all, of men who call themselves feminists because they've got no respect for the autonomy of our movement and don't realise they should be supporting us and not taking over, who are saying, this is about me pole dancing my way to liberation. <laughs> How dare you tell me I can't consent to be a sex worker when feminism is all about me, 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 me. And I say, no, it is not. It is about us. So until... <laughs> So when every woman is free, and when patriarchy is a relic in a museum, when male supremacy is no longer here, then let's talk about sex work, shall we? Then let's talk about the rights of men to buy sex. Because I'm telling you, when that day comes, there will be no prostitution. Because it is based on, and it thrives from, patriarchy and women's oppression. And nothing that any individual rights activist or neoliberal dickhead can tell us will make any bit of difference to that. Overthrow patriarchy, it may not take five years, it may take a bit longer. Then we'll see an end to the sex trade. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. Thank you. Our next speaker is the founder of Space International, survivors of prostitution abuse calling for enlightenment. And this woman is indeed enlightened. Having survived herself being prostituted from the age 15 till 22 in brothels and on the streets of Dublin, she can tell us what prostitution is. Rachel Moran has been standing in the front lines against Amnesty's policy on prostitution for years. And she is one of the strongest voices we have today advocating for the Nordic model internationally. Rachel has a journalist uh, degree, and she is the author of, a, of the book Paid For, My Journey Through Prostitution, which has just been released also in the United States. She has recently spent a month traveling to promote it over there, and she's attending a London Feminist Conference tomorrow. So we are very delighted, Rachel, that you could fin find time to come here in between. Thank you, hello. Okay. Thank you. Um, you know, I was thinking last night in, in my hotel room, I was turning over a few... Can you hear this now? Not closer. Can you hear me now? Oh, grand. Um, I was having to think to myself last night before I went to sleep in my hotel room and I was thinking about the way that we have spent all these years in this movement telling the truth and trying to expose what's going on here by telling the truth and illuminating the lies of others with our truths. And it occurred to me that maybe that's not enough. So I made a little mental note in my head that I've repeated here and it is that it's not enough to tell the truth. We must also deliberately and aggressively work to expose the lies mm -hmm. that we're up against. Mm -hmm. And when Julie was speaking earlier, it, it reminded me of that, so I made that note. Because people are very often bamboozled, and I mean well-intentioned, um, the man and woman on the street, people who know really nothing about how the sex trade operates, how it functions, in the mechanics of what it is. And it's very often those people who um, are vulnerable to what I call um, innocent ignorance, in that they want to see they want to see the women safe, and so they say, out of their their own good naturedness, well, we need to decriminalise pimps and johns, or we need to legalise the sex trade, we need to do whatever it is that we need to do in order to keep the women safe. 
Well, one thing that I'm very heartened to see is that the women in New Zealand are finally starting to speak out. Um, the decriminalization model that Amnesty International have endorsed has been in operation in New Zealand since 2003. So they have over a decade now of evidence of how that model actually works, how it shakes down and how it impacts on women's lives. And just this last year or so, several women have approached me, some of whom um, are sex trade survivors from the decriminalized New Zealand regime, and a few of whom are actually still prostituting right now in the, in the decriminalized, all above board, socially acceptable brothels of New Zealand. And some of what they've told me hurts me um, more deeply than anything I've heard, quite frankly, from regimes where, where prostitution is not legally sanctioned. Because the first thing that happens in a nation like that is that there are no exit routes. Once you socially sanction prostitution as all normal and all above board and just another form of labor, immediately you cut off your exit strategies. It's about as ludicrous now in, in New Zealand to suggest exit strategies for women in prostitution as it would be to suggest exit strategies for women in hairdressing or floristry mm. anywhere, any place else. And what we have to understand is that, you know, we are not any of us one-dimensional beings. There's a lot at play here and there's a psychology at work to what's going on in New Zealand. For the New Zealand government to turn around and put massive funding into helping women exit prostitution, it would have to publicly declare and admit that it had failed them in the mm -hmm. first place. Mm -hmm. People don't seem to see the really, really deep harm and damage that is done by these decriminalization regimes which are no different, by the way, to legalization. You know, whatever way the pro-lobby want to spin it, the reality is that when you decriminalize pimps and johns, you see the same thing everywhere. You see a massive expansion of the sex trade. You see the building of enormous multi-story brothels. Um, you see practices like what's going on in Germany that are actually horrific to the extent that um, they go far beyond anything I experienced in prostitution, and I'm, I'm very lucky to be able to say so. Um, for anybody here who doesn't know, can I hear a young child in here? Is there a young child in here? Yes. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be careful then about um, how graphic I get. I didn't, I didn't realize. Oh, that's okay, that's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> that's, that's convenient. Okay. There are practices in Germany now, which some of you I'm sure will know about being movement women and men. Um, practices that are so degrading, so painful, um, and so horrific that you, you wouldn't, and to my mind, you, you shouldn't see them outside of a horror movie. I'm sure you'll see them in porn, which is a horror show all of its own. But anyway, I'm talking about women who are being gangbanged by six and seven men until they physically cannot stand anymore. This is what's going on in the flat rate brothels. And um, flat rate, by the way, is the sex trade's equivalent of an all-you-can-eat buffet, mm -hmm. so that men will show up um, for a stag night, let's say, and pay to use the body of a woman or women, um, and just have some kind of a sexual feast. You know, and the idea is that they can have as much sex as they possibly can, and then that, and that's your flat rate. That would have been absolutely unthinkable to women in 1990s prostitution in Ireland, and particularly to street women, by the way. We just would not have even tolerated um, that, that idea. But then we weren't living in a decriminalized regime. We weren't living in a regime where the state had said to men, you can do whatever the hell you want. And that's exactly what New Zealand has done, just like Germany, just like Holland, just like several states in Australia and several counties in Nevada and the US and, and in numerous other places besides um, Switzerland and Austria, which we don't speak about nearly often enough. Mm. Um, but I've made a few notes here that I'm going to read from um, before I talk briefly about a, a friend of mine, because I think that we need to really bring this 
back to the human level because the abstract, talking about prostitution um, in the abstract is something that I find that our political opponents do ad nauseum. Yeah. And I think that they do that because if they get into talking about it on the human level, there's nothing convincing that they can say. <laughs> so what I want to say is that um, women are compelled by poverty, by destitution, by the fear of destitution, by all these roots of desperation, women are compelled. Those who accept the bald reality that women are compelled cannot collude with the lie that the sex of prostitution is consensual. Of course, people will say, well then, no form of labor is truly consensual. I have two answers to that. Firstly, you are wrong when you say prostitution is a form of labor. Not everything we endure for remuneration deserves the, class the classification of labor. And two, you are right when you say no form of labor is truly consensual. As far as labor is concerned, under capitalist patriarchy, we are compelled to do it. Even the most sought after forms of labor on this earth have got to have their moments, even those who do the most sought after forms of labor on this earth have got to have their moments when they say, oh please, not today. But if your labor is characterized by, oh please, not today, in every moment of living it, <clears throat> and every moment of anticipating it, and every moment of remembering it, decades after it has passed, we're not talking about labor. We're talking about commercialized sexual abuse. We need to not deal with the insult to our intelligence that happens when, when we call this labor. And I want to just highlight, as if we didn't already know, but it always bears repeating, that prostitute people are drawn from the most vulnerable persons, from the most vulnerable populations on the planet. I'm talking about adolescents, women and children of color, trans persons, people who, like myself, came from backgrounds where there was um, emotional disturbance in the family, mental ill health, um, homelessness, all of this. If Prostitution was something that was only open to those who could genuinely choose between prostitution and another viable option. We all know the sex trade would collapse tomorrow. I'm not going to go on for too much longer. I really prefer the Q&A and I don't want to hold up any of my co-panelists. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Rachel. The next woman to talk to us today has a long list of prizes and awards to show for after spending her entire life working to end prostitution and human trafficking. Only this year she was given the UN Woman of the Year Award. Ruchira Gupta is a journalist and she has been working in many countries. She won an Emmy after making a film about the red light district in Mumbai for CBC called The Selling of Innocence. Ruchira is the founder of Apna Up, an Indian organization of survivors of prostitution. This woman is a real activist, and the people in Apna Up are real heroes. They reach out and they rescue girls and women in India for, from a lifetime of rape. So far, they have saved over 21,000 women and girls from prostitution. Often these women are pimped out by their own family members and it can be very difficult to work with the authorities. Now, I will let Ruchira herself tell you more about the work they do and I promise you'll be amazed. Thank you. Um, after such a flattering introduction, I hope I live up to your uh, expectations. Um, I'm truly honored to be here with Quinna Franton and uh, with three very respected colleagues whose work I follow from India as I organize um, 
women and girls both at risk to prostitution and those who are already prostituted and trapped in brothels across India. My own work began 18 years ago as a journalist. I was walking the hills of Nepal when I came across rows of villages which didn't have any girls from age 15 to 45. And I was really surprised. So I began to ask the men who were sitting there drinking tea, playing cards, where all these girls were. And some of the men were hostile, some were angry, some were sheepish, some were silent, but a few answered. And they said, don't you know, they all are in Bombay. Now, that was very, very puzzling to me because Bombay was 1,400 kilometers away. And these villages were so remote that they were even two hours away from the highway. So I began to look for the answer as a good journalist. And the answer changed my life because I found that in my lifetime, in my generation, in my country, modern day slavery existed. There was a smooth supply chain from these remote villages to the brothels of Bombay. In the village, there was the poor farmer who was starving, who was isolated, illiterate, and there was the procurer. The procurer could be a shopkeeper, an uncle, a neighbor, who would go to this poor starving farmer and offer $50, $100 for his 13-year-old daughter and say that I will get her a job in the big city or I will even put her into prostitution, but at least she will have a bed and two meals a day and maybe send some money back home. Now, the farmer had no idea about the realities of prostitution, about Bombay, nothing, and he let his daughter go. These procurers would collect together two or three girls in the big cities of Kathmandu and Biratnagar and they hand them over to a set of transporters. The transporters would take them to the border of India and Nepal. And there, there were the corrupt border guards. Wink, wink, nod, nod. The girls were taken across the border. On the other side were the lodge keepers. In these shabby lodges made of corrugated cement and plastic sheets, the girls were drugged and locked up for two or three days, beaten, starved, till their spirits were completely subjugated, and they were willing to do anything. That was when they were handed over to another set of transporters, who then put them on trucks and trains and buses and took them to the brothels of Bombay and Calcutta. And in the brothels of Bombay and Calcutta were the pimps who would negotiate the price of these girls, depending on their beauty. And by beauty, I mean um, the younger, the better. The youngest I have met is a seven-year-old. She hadn't even menstruated and ice was used to break her. The average age of a girl being pulled into prostitution in India is between 9 and 13. There are 3 million women and girls who are trapped in prostitution in India as I speak today, and this is the Central Bureau of India's uh, statistic, of which 1.4 million are children, and the other 1.6 million were brought in as children. And the other part of beauty was fair skin. Fair skin was at a premium. These girls were then handed over to the pimps, who would give the money to the man who had transported them. Uh, depending on the beauty I, and age, they were given uh, 200, 300, 500 dollars. Uh, voluptuous girls were more welcome. Docile girls were more welcome, more sought after. And then the pimp would hand over these girls to the brothel managers. The brothel managers would lock up these girls in small rooms with iron bars in the window for the next five years. And there, these girls were brought out for eight or 10 customers every night. Each customer would pay 30 cents, a dollar, for virgins more, and as the girls grew older, less. And behind the brothel managers were the landlords, behind the landlords, the money lenders or the financiers, and behind that, the organized criminal networks. I spent years researching this, nearly two years, ended up making a documentary called The Selling of Innocence on this. I won an Emmy for Outstanding Investigative Journalism, but the process of making the documentary changed my life because I had never seen this kind of deliberate exploitation of one human being by another. I, as a journalist, I'd covered war, I'd covered famine, I'd covered hunger, I'd covered caste conflict. But I'd never seen this kind of exploitation. As a woman, as a journalist, as a citizen of India, of the world, I was angry, I was humiliated, I was outraged. Mm -hmm. So I made the documentary, won an Emmy, 
And on the night that I was in New York taking my award, I felt the Emmy was not enough and journalism was limiting. So I quit journalism and uh, decided to do something about this issue. I didn't know how. I wasn't a social worker. I wasn't a lawyer. I wasn't a doctor. But I went back to Bombay to the 22 women in prostitution who had told their stories in my documentary to ask them, what can we do? We sat together in a circle, very much as we are sitting here together. And I asked the women, what should we do? And the women said, oh, let's start an NGO. So I said, but I don't know how to run an NGO. <laughs> so they said, but you know how to read and write. You know, you know how to access people with power. You can get money. So those are the things you can do. We know nothing. So then I reminded them. I said, that, do you remember that when I was making my documentary, somebody pulled out a knife on me and told me that I will not let you film. And at that time, the women surrounded me and saved me. And they told the man that if you want to kill her, you have to kill all 22 of us. And the man thought it would be too much trouble, and he <laughs> slunk away. <laughs> and I said, so we, they, I said, we can form circles. And we can rescue each other. And you know what nobody else knows. Your experience is your knowledge. So based on that, we started Apne Aap. Apne Aap means self-empowerment in Hindi. And that was our first circle in the brothels of Bombay. And I asked the women, I said, what should be the mission of the organization? What should the goals be? And it was very, very clear to them. They said the mission should be to create, our vision was a world in which no human being is bought or sold. A girl, a boy, a man, or a woman, anybody. And with that vision, then we fine-tuned our mission, which was to end sex trafficking. And under that, we decided, how do you end sex trafficking? What do you do? They said, let's dismantle the system of prostitution. Because trafficking is just a process. Prostitution is the outcome. And I asked them, I said, but then how do we dismantle the system of prostitution? And they said something to me in Hindi. They said, as long as there's a customer, there will always be prostitution. Mm -hmm. Because somebody will want to make a profit out of it. So we have to stop the customers. And we have to stop the traffickers. And at that time, they spelled out four dreams when we started Apne Aap. The first dream was they wanted an education for their children. They said, whatever has happened to us has happened. We want to save our daughters. Can we educate them? The second dream was, they said they wanted a job in an office. And I asked them, I said, you know, what does a job in an office mean to you? Because they were literally in small rooms, uh, you know, with broken uh, floors and rat infested, no toilets, iron bars in the window, and, you know, no electricity, nothing. And I said, what does a job in an office mean to you? And they said, where we have nine to working hours, fixed working hours from nine to five, old age pension, where nobody shouts at us and beats us, where we have a fixed monthly income. In prostitution, you have none of that. Mm -hmm. The third dream they said was that they wanted, funnily enough, a room of their own. I was an English literature student, and I couldn't understand it. So I thought I was hearing wrong, that I'm listening to a <coughs> prostituted woman in a brothel in Bombay, and she is saying she wants a room of her own, like Virginia Woolf, but she was saying that. And I said, what does that mean? And she said, something just this big, not very long, not very long. And they kept using that word, not very long. But somewhere we can sleep for as long as we want to, where nobody can walk in when they want to, where our children can play peacefully on the floor. And the fourth dream, they said, was justice. And that also seemed really remote sitting inside uh, that chawl in Bombay. And I said, justice? What does justice mean? And they said they wanted those who had brokered away their dreams to be punished. And I said, who had brokered it away? The pimps, the brothel keepers, the people who recruited them, the ones who transported them, and the ones who were buying them, the customers. They call them clients in India. And they also wanted protection. They said that when we try to run away from the brothels, there is nobody to protect us. The police send us back here. 
when we were in school and pulled out of school and put into a brothel, there was no truancy officer to show up in our school to find out why we'd gone missing. We want somebody to protect us and our daughters. So justice to them meant both accountability and protection. So based on four, these four dreams we started Apne Aap. Fast forward, Apne Aap is now 14 years old and we've moved from just working in Bombay to Calcutta to Bihar to Delhi, all over the country. And we work inside red light areas and slums. And uh, the dreams have become a reality for more than 21,000 girls and women. We've educated 814 of their children who've been through school. The first batch is now going to college. Um, we've managed to get papers and documents for the women who never had any citizenship documents. They had no identity, so they had no political power. So one of our organizing strategies was to make them campaign, fill up forms, stand outside politicians' homes and offices, and get these government IDs. And from that, we went on to getting government subsidies from low-cost housing to food coupons, housing vouchers, which reduced their expenses. And that enabled them to file cases against traffickers. And we put 66 traffickers into jail. And finally, in 2013, when uh, all of you must have read about the bus rape which happened in India, uh, the maximum number of women who marched on the streets of Delhi were the women from Apne Aap in the rallies outside parliament because they had found their voice. Uh, they had the protection of their documents, the fact that the children were going to school. They had alternatives to prostitution. And because of that, they had the ability to speak up. And there, they marched on the streets saying prostitution is commercial rape. And so in the new anti-rape bill that parliament is going to be passing, we want the traffickers and the rapists who uh, buy and sell us, uh, who rape us of commercially to be punished just like other rapists are punished. They went and testified to the Verma Commission. They went and met members of parliament. They broke their silence. They got over their own shame and stigma to do so. And we got an anti-rape law which actually criminalized the process of trafficking. Yeah. But now, now the big challenge is reasserting itself in two ways. One is, as Julie was talking about and Rachel spoke about, the pro-sex work lobby which is very active in India. And the more we gain, the more backlash we have to suffer. So they're beating up our women. Some of our most vocal activists have been beaten. One of our staff members, uh, who was the son of a prostituted woman, two of his sisters were prostituted, was arrested on false charges of trafficking and put into jail. And he's only out on bail right now. The charges have not been dropped against him. Another staff member's daughter was kept in jail all night in the name of rescuing her, uh, that she was in a red light area and uh, she was living in the home of one of our activist staff members. And so we are facing uh, backlash uh, from the police, a corrupt police system. At the same time, uh, we are facing backlash from the pro-sex work lobby, who is going after the big foundations that work in India and who give big money to the tune of millions of dollars, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which has donated more than $500 million uh, to India to set up an AIDS control program. That entire AIDS control program was designed by McKinsey, and most of the McKinsey staffers are 45-year-old men who only believe in selling products. So to look for a solution to the problem of AIDS, the product that they focused on was condoms, and the problem that they focused on was the number of sexual transactions in the red light areas of India. So they decided that to uh, reduce AIDS, they would give condoms to the customers who came to buy the women and girls. Never mind what happened to the women and girls. And some of the leaders of that program have actually written journal articles in which they have said that when you go inside a brothel and you see a woman being abused, ignore it, because otherwise you will upset the status quo inside the brothel and you will not be able to distribute condoms. The other thing which they did was that through this money which they channeled 
through United Nations AIDS program, through uh, 23 international organizations like Care International, Population Services International, uh, through our own government's Ministry of Health, uh, and through 126 NGOs that they funded, what they also did was that they hired pimps and brothel keepers as peer educators inside the red light districts. And they began to get salaries through these programs, so they became even more powerful. And their job was to ignore all the violence, all the exploitation in the brothels, but just go distribute condoms. They also funded ad campaigns through Population Services International, which actually said, it doesn't matter uh, which sex worker you choose, choose the right condom. So people could buy 14-year-olds, it did not matter. And they created a false notion of quote-unquote ethical demand, that you could buy a prostituted girl or woman so long as you used a condom. Yeah. Your responsibility ended with using a condom. They threw poor, the most marginalized women and girls under the bus by doing so. Because they did not invest in the education of the children. They did not invest in the exit strategies for women and girls. And even before that, they allowed the state not to invest in um, just welfare for the most marginalized human beings in our society, who are poor, who are female, who are low caste, and very often teenagers. The government cut down midday meal programs for poor girls. They've closed down boarding schools for poor girls. They've, uh, there are no protection programs for poor marginalized women at all. They're considered disposable people. So this $500 million did immense damage across our civil society because everyone got a piece of the cake. They got some money, some consultancy, some trips abroad, some legitimacy, some journal articles, donations, all of that. And so that was the second challenge that we faced. And the third challenge that we faced uh, was the invention of the word sex worker. Mm. Because it was literally invented in front of our eyes. There was no poor woman or girl who thought that uh, sex and work <coughs> should go together. They all loved sex. They wanted it with their partners and their friends and their lovers and their uh, husbands. And, but they did not want to lose control of their sexuality. In prostitution, you actually lose control of your sexuality. Because somebody is coming and buying you, and they are not even buying you very often for sex for you. They are buying it for sex for themselves. They are the ones who get the orgasm. Mm -hmm. and if that, because many of them are just buying domination. Mm -hmm. Even the three men who went out to rape the girl on the bus on 13th April in 2013, those men had watched porn and a woman being raped on their cell phone before, and they were on their way to the red light area of Delhi. But suddenly this girl came along, they gave her a lift and raped her instead. So they had normalized the sexual violence to women, and that's what they were going out in a gang to do. We work in the red light district of Sonagachi, which very often is uh, promoted by the sex work lobby as uh, an example of the unionizing of sex workers. And we know that it is all propaganda. Because otherwise, we would not be allowed to work there. It's the women in prostitution, the prostituted women, who have invited us to open an office in Sonagachi. We had started in another red light area of Calcutta, thinking, OK, somebody is working here. They must be providing some services. There were absolutely no services provided to the women and girls, mm -hmm. only to the customers in, in the form of condoms and male mm -hmm. clinics just outside the brothels to check them to see if they had any diseases. Mm -hmm. Nothing for the women and girls. So they approached us and they said, please come here because we need help to put our daughters into school too. We need help, help with exit strategies. The women were being murdered. The women were being brutalized. And there was no protection for them because the sex industry had got legitimized in Sonagachi in the name 
of protecting everybody from AIDS. And today, we managed to get the, red, uh, the uh, funding closed down from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to the Sonagachi project, but the damage had been done. The pimps and brothel keepers who want salary began to call themselves sex workers, and they became members of their own union. The employers, this is the only union in the world where the employers are members. <coughs> and the yeah. customers. And yeah. the customers. And the academics. And, and <laughs> yes, and, and then uh, inside that association, the women who are controlled by these employers are told, okay, today you have to march on the streets to say that you want to be le legalized. Today you have to say that we want our pimps to be legalized. Today you have to say our brothel keepers have to be legalized. So they had to do whatever these people were telling them to do because they were being controlled by them. And these people now are under retreat because the academics of Calcutta began to see the damage it had done to the entire women's movement of Calcutta. Because while normalizing the sexual exploitation of some women inside the red light area, we saw the spate of rapes went up in Calcutta. And that was getting normalized too as well in Calcutta, in Delhi, in Bombay. Because people began to think all women were up for grabs. If a woman was walking out at night, she must be like a prostitute. And prostitutes were supposed to be up for grabs and for violence. So everybody became at risk. And now the women's movement in India is actually revising its opinions, especially uh, trade unions, um, uh, women associated with left academic groups. Uh, we are finding that there's a change there. And now, finally, uh, you know, why did we reject the term sex worker was also one more reason. I began to see the lived realities of the girls and women over the years and what they experienced. The lived reality was in prostitution in India, uh, the life cycle of a prostitute at best is about 15 years. She's brought in between the age of 9 and 13, and for the first five years, she's kept in what is called debt bondage. Debt bondage means you're basically enslaved, and you're told that your father took a loan against you, which could be for like $100 only, and that you are repaying the loan by letting the person who controls you, the brothel manager, make money off you. For the next five years, that girl is raped commercially every night by 10 customers. Within one week, the debt is repaid, but she does not even know it. So she's allowed to keep nothing of what she earns. For the next five years, she's told she can keep half of what she earns, but that half actually is also kept by the brothel manager who says that you have to pay for the bed you sleep on, the water you drink, the makeup you put, the clothes you wear, for the muscle men who protect you from the police, the medicines you have to take for your children's upkeep. And she's lost count being raped so many times, suffering from psychosocial trauma. So she, begins, she doesn't even know and she gets just deeper into debt. It doesn't improve her livelihood. The third five years, she's told, okay, now you can keep everything that you earn. But by then, her earning capacity has come down because she's been raped so much. She has different diseases. She's suffering from malnourishment. She's suffering from alcohol and uh, dependency on alcohol and drugs. She's been uh, violated all over her body by customers. So her, uh, she's no longer commercially viable. And that's when the brothel managers throw her out and say, we want to replace you with your daughter. And that's when they come to organizations like Apne Aap saying, can you help us at least protect our daughters if you can't protect us? Mm. And this is the reality we have seen. So this cannot be accepted as work because in that case, we will change the very nature of livelihood that all of us are aspiring for. What all the labor movements have tried for because prostitution has one thing which is different from all forms of even sweatshop work that is body penetration. And that has both physical and mental consequences, and I have seen that repeatedly with the girls and women I work for. So on their behalf today, I'm here to share with you that we do not use the term sex worker, and we use the term prostituted woman or prostituted child, uh, because we believe somebody has taken advantage of the absence of choice of the last girl, 
who's poor female, low caste in India and a teenager, who's the weakest person we know. So prostitution was never a choice for her, but an absence of choice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Ruchira. The last speaker we have in this panel is from closer to home. Maria Arlene is actually from Norway, but she lives in Sweden. Maria is the founder of a youth organization called Freedom, which aims to end the modern day slavery, which human trafficking is. They do this by working on the attitudes of young people regarding prostitution and porn. As well as in Sweden, Freedom is currently also represented here in Norway, in Germany, and in Austria. Uh, they inspire young people to start groups and ask questions in their local communities. Maria will tell us about the Nordic sex market and how the Nordic model is crucial to end prostitution. We will also learn more about her experience of Freedom's work, spreading knowledge and awareness of trafficking. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. How are you? You're good? Despite the topic, you're good? <laughs> Fantastic. Why don't we? Yeah, perfect. Right, so important detail. I am from Norway. I like to, to say that. Uh, but I do live in Sweden and have been living in Sweden for nine years. And when I moved from, from Norway, from Oslo, to Uppsala, close to Stockholm, I started high school in Sweden. And the only actual difference when you're going to finish high school in Sweden compared to Norway would be that you have to do a final school project. And the only rule for that project is that it takes 100 hours, mm -hmm. which I thought was fantastic. And I actually wanted to go abroad and get some tan and maybe do the diving license or something. But then I discovered that, you know, I might as well do something more valuable with those 100 hours. So I had like a fundraising project, you could call it, inviting actually business people to come and to listen to, to a topic, you know, the, the topic of prostitution and trafficking being presented. And after this, you have to actually tell your classmates what you did. And I remember asking, and let's say it was a group about this size, and we were 19 at that time. And I asked my fellow classmates if they knew what trafficking was and how it expressed itself as prostitution and what the situation was in Sweden and in Scandinavia. And this is about eight years ago. And at that time, actually, no one raised their hand. And this kind of troubled me, you know? So I started thinking about this, and summer went on, and I finished high school. And by the fall, I just realized, you know what? I cannot just go on, live my life, and know that nobody knows about this. This is just not uh, acceptable. So in Sweden, the rule is that you have to be three people to start an organization. I was one. So mm -hmm. I kind of forced my, my boyfriend at that time, which now we're married, so it turned out good. <laughs> and another friend of mine. So we were only three people in the beginning. Uh, but now, as you said, we are based in Austria, Germany, uh, Norway, and Sweden, which is fantastic, I think. And it's all young people uh, wanting to change the situation and really just question the, you know, the system of pr prostitution. And also it's about you know, the demand side. We really want to get young people on board to get a new generation of people thinking differently about prostitution, not thinking it's the oldest profession, but the oldest oppression. So that's uh, basically what we're doing. Um, the situation in Scandinavia, just briefly about the situation, you could see, just as you could see that prostitution is something dividing Europe into two and the European Union into two, you would also see that it's actually dividing also Scandinavia, you could say, partially into two, because we have Denmark, uh, which is a country that has legalized prostitution. And you could, just as Germany is kind of the brothel of Europe, you know, the nickname would be the brothel of Europe, mm -hmm. uh, Denmark would be the brothel of Scandinavia, you could say that. And we do have, both in Sweden and in Norway, let's focus on Sweden and Norway for now, we do have street prostitution, we have indoor prostitution, we have so-called uh, apartment brothels, you know, where prostitution is happening. Um, but I would say, and especially, this is especially for Sweden, obviously internet is the new arena for prostitution. 
uh, that's where most of it is happening, you know? But I'm very, I have to say, I'm really, really proud of Sweden being the first country to really do something about this and to really say that, you know what, buying sex is not a human right. We have to question this. So then, you know, we're really starting to kind of shift the focus, you could say. And in Sweden, we had done a lot of research. I'm saying we, I, I'm identifying with you as an, as a Norwegian, but I'm saying we when I'm representing Sweden. Uh, we would say that we would have, let's say, 34 years of research in Sweden uh, on prostitution. And what we really discovered was that, you know what, prostitution is really harmful, you know, both to the individual and to the society. And the main focus before 1999, when we got the, the Swedish model, the Nordic model, the main focus was still on the trafficker and the pimp, you know, for them keeping up with the system. But that's when we kind of realized, you know what, we have to kind of shift focus here. We need to really address the real issue, and that is that people are actually prepared to pay for sex. That is what is driving prostitution. And the thing is that, just as my fellow speakers have said here, that sex trafficking expresses itself as prostitution. And I think it was you who said it really, really well, that trafficking is just a process. The outcome is prostitution. You cannot separate those two. It's just not possible. It's just like one plus one is two, and trafficking equals prostitution. That's just how it is. So I think it's really, really important that we are prepared to really focus on the demand. And we also need to talk about the attitudes really driving uh, the demand. So I want to go to uh, the Nordic model. Um, let's go to the why, the why part. So Sweden got the Nordic model in a minute. There you go. Okay, it's a bit shifted, but I, can you see it? Yeah, good. Right, so Sweden got the Nordic model in 1999. And I have to tell you, dear friends, that I used to live in Norway by that time. I was only 10 years old. And I can actually remember people mm -hmm. in my surrounding, grown-ups, laughing about Sweden. Something, you know, something stupid that Sweden has done, something, you know, this crazy law that they got. And I was only 10 years old. But I still remember this. I still remember my dad talking about Sweden as a really bad example of something. And I didn't, you know, I didn't understand it at that time. And I also remember laughing, you know, of Sweden, you know, just to kind of feel adult or something. But then when moving to Sweden and I just realized, wow, this is a law that, you know, I remember people laughing of. And I, you know, I find it so interesting that Norway then, 10 years later, decided to, you know, exchange laughter into uh, action and really decided to go the same way. And I think that's fantastic. And I think that's a lot of proof, actually, that they do, you know, they can see that what's happening in Sweden is really uh, good, basically. So it's basically, you know, the law is based upon the, you know, the acknowledgement that prostitution is harmful for individual and for uh, society. That's like the main base for the law. And what I really like about the law is that it's a normative law, meaning, it is controversial because it's normative, you know, it's supposed to change the way we think about prostitution. Yeah. It's actually kind of going inside your head and changing the way you view prostitution. And you could find that controversial, obviously, but still that is also where everything starts. It starts in your mind, it starts with your thoughts, it starts with your attitudes. Everything you do starts with the thoughts. So we have to kind of go inside people's minds and really, you know, just really change the foundation of our thinking in terms of prostitution. So it also was a law, or is a law, meant to uh, prevent entry into prostitution, you know? It's, prevent, it's a preventive law, that's why, you know, I really love it. In Freedom, we really like to work preventive, you know? We want to do something before it actually happens. Not only cutting the grass, you know, the, the weed when it shows, but actually, you know, tearing it up with the roots. I think that's very crucial. So this is a preventive law meant to both change people's minds, but also to prevent people from entering the sex industry and also prevent people from even buying sex. You know, it's harder to learn an old dog to sit. You know, you have to start with the young, with the youngsters. And finally, it's a tool to combat sex trafficking, meaning we do acknowledge the fact that sex trafficking exp expresses itself as prostitution. Therefore, we need to talk about the demand and we need to use this as a tool. And you have to know that the Swedish police are actually saying, they said it just last Monday at a big conference, that the most important tool that they have against trafficking is this law. That's how they find the bars, that's how they find the people in prostitution, and that's how they find the pimps. 
This is very important. So the law, you could say, is based upon three perspectives. First is equality, and meaning that even though it could be just the opposite, you know, you still have people buying sex from both gender, you know, but we do still acknowledge that the majority of people buying sex are male, and then the majority of people selling sex are female. So therefore, in a modern day society, this is just not acceptable that one gender gets to buy another gender. That's really the thinking uh, behind the law. Also, it has a sort of a victim perspective. Or, you know, obviously, you could argue, you know, in terms of the word here, victim. I really like what you're using, uh, survivor. I think that's fantastic. Um, but that's what it kind of just says in the legal framework that it has a victim perspective, meaning that we do not want to blame those who are already in this vulnerable position. Just as, as you said, that we do not want to criminalize those selling sex because we, you know, we acknowledge that they are in a vulnerable position and we do not want to place you know, even more burden upon them and making them vulnerable and criminal. You know, that's just not happening. So I'm, I'm a fan of that too. And also third, the third perspective is to really target demand and to really you know, just establish the fact that you know, what is driving this is the demand. This is just like any other business. You know, if I'm gonna sell my, my pants to you, I need to be aware that you wanna buy my pants. Otherwise, I'm not gonna make any money. So it's just like simple economy thinking here. So just some short facts. Um, can we see the next? Yeah. Right, I just wanna share with you that Denmark, even though Denmark is uh, 40 times smaller than Sweden, you still have four times as much human trafficking cases. In 2008, you had 2,250 trafficking cases in Denmark. I think this shows, you know, in terms of Denmark legalizing prostitution and in terms of Sweden criminalizing the buying of sex. Also, you would see if you do studies, and there is a huge study done with a cross-section of 150 countries, you would see that those countries who have legalized prostitution have enormous amounts of trafficking cases compared to, for instance, Sweden or, or even Norway now, because Norway are getting there, I have to tell you. And what I really find is so fantastic is that young people tend to be more supportive in terms of this law. And you can actually really see that people growing up with the law agree with it more, you know? And that is a very good proof, actually, that it does work because those growing up with it tend to, to agree with it, tend to think it's a good law. And in the beginning in Sweden, I mean, no one even wanted this law. It was such a debate, just as you've had here and still have in some form uh, in Norway in terms of this law. But now we really see that the public support is really increasing. And in Sweden, let's say we have about 70 to 80% of people agreeing with this law. And most of the support is for the young people. They are the most supportive. Um, and I think that's just a proof of its own. Just to sh quickly show you, the Nordic Gender Institute found that what's happening in Sweden before and after the law would be, yeah, you see it. It's about a 50% decrease in people buying sex. This is not the whole solution. You know, this law is not going to fix everything. It's not going to completely, you know, just make people not buy sex. People are still going to buy sex in some form or way. You know, that's why this law also needs to be combined with exit programs. It needs to be combined with what we're in Sweden, we call it cast groups, meaning köpare av sexuella tjänster, buyers of the sexual services. So it's basically a group where you can come and you can talk with someone, you know, a therapy session kind of, if you want to just quit buy sex. And I think that's really good. You need to kind of combine the law with this uh, preventive work and, and therapy work as well. Results from Norway. We, you know, we're in Norway, so I just want to show you what you guys actually did and, and how it actually turned out. This was the main results that the research could find after six months. This is only six months of the law being here in Norway. You did see a, a, a decrease in street prostitution. You did see a decrease in terms of escort advertising. And you did see a decrease in sex trafficking cases, legal cases. And this is only after six months. The next slide, you would see, this is only after eight months. Uh, after eight months, you could actually not see that the people had started to change their minds. They were still not agreeing uh, with this law. However, in Oslo, where people actually saw the prostitution, you know, the street prostitution, 
they actually already after eight months started to, to think you know, critical about prostitution because they could see it. You could actually see the re, you know, a connection here with those, between those who actually saw the prostitution. They tended to actually agree with prostitution not being the best solution in, in society. You could also see that the older population was less affected, you know, meaning what I said earlier, that it's, you know, it's obviously it's harder to learn an old dog to sit. So I think it's, it's quite fantastic that the young people were beginning to kind of realize, like, you know, this is, this is actually uh, a good solution. And after five years, you had your official evaluation. And I remember, because this was last year, and that was the year when we started Free Them in, in, uh, in Norway with Jeanette over there. Wave your hand. Woo! <laughs> and we were here the last year uh, starting up Free Them. And I just remember the debates going on. Do you remember that? You know, in terms of, the, of the, the, um, your pol poli politicals, you know, uh, when you're going to choose your political party. And I just remember, like, the parties were kind of, like, promising that if... If you know, if you vote on us, we will just completely take away this law. Some of you remember this, yeah. And I was actually thinking, you know what? It doesn't actually look like this law is going to stay here. It actually looks like it's going to be gone. They're kind of promising us that. And but you know, the thing is that before you take away a law, obviously you have to do an ev you know an evaluation. And this is the main findings from that evaluation. Uh, we don't have to go deeper into it, but you can see it. Overall decrease. Uh, bigger, you know, more decrease in street prostitution in some cities, Oslo, for instance, decrease in demand, less Norwegian buyers, etc., etc. And after this evaluation, the law is still here, and I think that it, you know, it speaks, it speaks to to itself. Why not legalize? Just to kind of give you some examples, why not legalize? Um, as I said, Germany, brothel of Europe, this is really the number of people in prostitution in Germany is obviously debated and it's not really, you know, you need to, we need to be open that this number may be wrong, but most of the people in Germany would agree that you have around 400,000 people in prostitution. And compared to, let's say, Sweden, we actually agree on having 1,000 people in prostitution. That's a big difference. That's a very big difference. In Amsterdam, after legalizing prostitution, just a couple of years after, the mayor of Amsterdam went out of publicly in media saying that, you know what, we really screwed up. This did just not work. We're sorry, we meant good, but this is just not working. Minors in prostitution are increasing, drug trafficking is increasing, gun trafficking is increasing, etc., etc. So I'm really you know, excited to see what's happening in Netherlands for the upcoming years. Spain, 40% of people will of, of male population will go out and buy sex in Spain. This is also a country where buying sex is legal. This is a signal, you know, when you tell your society and you tell your people in, in the society that buying sex is okay, that this behavior is okay, obviously we're going to do it, you know? Who would ever think of legalizing murder to get rid of murders? That's just not, yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you. And the last one, Switzerland. I think one of my co-workers here said that uh, Switzerland, actually, I think it was you, Rachel, said that Switzerland actually often gets away easier than what they should be getting away because up until now, they've had 16 years limit of entering prostitution. So you can be 16 in prostitution. And obviously, then you're going to be younger as well because this is such a black market and it doesn't even care about age limits. So. Another really, um, yeah, according to Switzerland, they thought this was fantastic, a good idea to really make sure that people in prostitution are safe and not being evicted to, to any harm would be to then start something that they call drive-in sex boxes. Have you heard of this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of you have, yeah. It's basically boxes where you can drive in with your car, the people in prostitution would be inside of this box, getting into your car, what's happening is happening, and then you would pay and just go out on the other side. If that is not human trafficking, if that is not människohandel, menskohandel, then I don't know what is, you know? This is so, we need to really understand that are we legalizing prostitution, then we will get the whole industry and the whole trafficking and everything. And it's, yeah, we need to do, uh, we need to do something. That's, yeah, so really, like, be proud of your legislation here in Norway. Please be proud of that. It's not the perfect solution. It's not going to fix all your problems, but it's the best of the worst. You know? 
So, last but not least, freedom. I really realized, you know, when we started Freedom in Sweden, that it was such, um, like, people were so hungry for actually doing something, especially among young people. They were just, like, waiting for a platform to really stand upon and to really actually take action and speak up. So, Freedom is basically just a youth movement. The next, mm -hmm. next slide, youth movement. We really think that young people are the new generation that can really question this. And we can really say that, you know what, buying sex is not a human right and it's not an option. Selling sex, I mean, people deserve more than to be in prostitution. Prostitution is, I would say, our day, you know, the most harmful thing that can ever happen to, to a person. Absolutely. And we're all about changing attitudes. We really want to see a different way of thinking in terms of these issues, you know. So the challenges ahead, I would say, are that we're seeing, especially in Sweden, we're seeing an increase in what we're calling grooming. You know, have you heard about that? Grooming cases. It's basically a grown-up seeking to, uh, you know, over, over internet, maybe in a chat log or, or, you know, something where they are chatting, and you would try to kind of groom the person and to really uh, prepare the person for a physical sexual assault, you know? So you're kind of... I'm a, I'm a horse girl, I ride horses, so if I would be living in the States, I would say that when I'm going to groom my horse, that's when I kind of clean it and make it nice, you know? So it's, it's a way of kind of massaging your way into the victim uh, as a perpetrator. And that is something that we are seeing uh, in Sweden now, especially, I mean, it, because of the internet, obviously. People are, instead of actually committing real rapes, like physical rapes, they would commit rapes over internet instead. And the highest Supreme Court has actually now just established in Sweden with the first legal case that went all the way up to the high Supreme Court. They actually established that if you do something over line, let's say you're forcing someone to penetrate themselves over a chat over via a webcam, that is considered rape. So it doesn't matter whether or not you're actually in physical contact with that person, it's still rape. So you can actually rape yourself, that's according to the which I think is fantastic because we need to kind of get along with what's happening, you know, the development of everything, technology. We need to be aware of, of really the situation like and to really follow up on that. Uh, the th second one I would just emphasize is that we do need more resources, you know. We need more resources. We need more people in, let's say, authorities, you know. We need more police officers. We need at least two police officers in each city because this is a crime Buying sex is a crime that you can only find as long as the police are really deciding to look for it, you know, because the seller is not going to tell you, the buyer is not going to tell you, and we are not going to tell anyone, you know, because it's not affecting us. We're going to, you know, call the police when someone is stealing our bike, not when someone is buying sex from another person. So this is really something that we need to have police officers really actively working on to find uh, the buyers. That's when you, when you get it. In Sweden, before we actually had the resources and people from, from the police working to, to prevent and to, to arrest uh, people buying sex, you would actually see that we had no sex buying in Sweden in the statistics, you know? But as soon as we started to have a unit with people uh, from the prostitution unit of the, of the Stockholm Police Department arresting buyers, then suddenly we have, just for the first year, we got 1,200 people buying sex arrested for that. So obviously you can still say that, oh no, prostitution is not happening in Oslo, but if you look for it, then you will find it. So this is really important. We need to combine the law with resources, uh, you know, police resources. And I would just like to finish off by addressing pornography. This is something that we see from research, like 30, 40 years of prostitution and pornography research. We do find that consuming pornography will increase the buying of sex. And also a lot of people in prostitution are now telling that the main question that they're getting, just as you said, is that the buyer wants to imit imitate something that they saw in pornography. And I would argue this is the new drug. This is something that we really have to focus on. It's a visual drug. It's not something you can shoot in your arm, but it's kind of being shot into your, into your brain via your eyes, you could say. It has the, just the same effect as any other drug. When doing brain scans of people addicted to pornography, you could see their brains lighting up as a Christmas tree. It's really just the same similar things happening in the brain. So this is something that I really think we should continue to address, and I really admire Kvinnefronten for really taking on this issue. Thank you.